Hi Ruby, how are you going? Not too bad. Getting through the lockdown, oh, but yeah. yeah. It's pretty tough. Uh, so it's been a while since we've had some um, interviews and uh, you, know, you and I have been trying to catch up for a while, but I think it's great to catch up now because we've had so many other interviews and it's been at different stages of lockdown. But this is now towards hopefully the end for Victoria and or at least entering into a stage that we're much more comfortable with. What's life been like for you in general and then, you know, maybe with school and training, just what's that been like? It's been a pretty wild year. Um, yeah, I don't think well, any, no one knew that this is what was coming. But, um, yeah, 2020 started off pretty well for me coming in with some form. So I was kind of just on a roll going from one race to the next and then um, moved to Adelaide, which was a big transition. Well, I thought it was a big transition at the time. Um, and then we actually went to Manchester from Adelaide when I moved over there. And then it was like right as COVID was kicking off and uh, Manchester got cancelled. And up until that point, like I knew it was going on, but I hadn't really looked into it too much and I wasn't, too worried about it, um, which in hindsight was a bit silly. But um, yeah, but then we got sent, we came home like a day later and then that's when I realized how serious it was gonna be. Um, and then we got sent home from Adelaide because we couldn't use the track and that was when we were going into the first lockdown. And then since then, it's been, um, time's gone really fast for me because I feel like it's just been very monotonous, but like I've just been, doing stuff every day, but every day is the same. So it's just like, feels like it's been like two months or something. Um, but yeah, just writing, um, studying, that's about it. <laughs> but yeah. it's, it's, like, it's like March never ended, right? It's still, yeah. it's still going on. So Groundhog Day for everyone. And we all feel it, but uh, it's particularly hard for people like you because you set yourself up and you, like you said, you're in Manchester, then you come back and don't be so hard on yourself about not taking it seriously because I really don't think anyone here did to be honest it was was something we saw as it was almost like the GFC of 2008 we saw it as something that was happening somewhere else and oh that's terrible but we'll probably be okay we're an island that won't happen to us and uh, and you know and look what's happened but uh, that that monotony and uh, and still being able to ride and study etc have there been moments where it's not not been too hard but you've had to rely or access others to to keep you up and keep you going i mean surely you you can't always stay on a on a positive and a high there must be moments where it's it's been a real challenge yeah definitely i think um we all the exterior self is always quite a positive self and i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing but i think it's also important to acknowledge that like no matter how successful someone is like even all the people i aspire to be they're the, they're still having bad days and we're all on a roller coaster like I think um the main thing is that you just like you expect the bad days and they're going to come and you make the most out of them and then you just ride that wave so I think in Melbourne especially just because we've had it so hard um you know as like the stage four lockdown comes in and we realize we can't ride outside like I think every cyclist who's trying to like make it to the next level saw that and was just like next few days were pretty hard um, but in saying that, we just adjust to the new circumstances and make the most of the opportunities we do have. So that's kind of my philosophy. And I think in some ways, having the mental challenge of going through this period, um, it's made me face like some of my demons. Like I'm someone who likes racing all the time. And like, I, I'm not, I don't love training. I think like there's some people who really love training but I love racing. That's why I'm in the sport and I love the community and the friendships. And that's kind of all the things that we don't have at the moment. So um, it's made me reconsider and re sort of conceptualize why I'm in the sport and really realize why I'm in the sport, which I hadn't really, I kind of just was like, Oh, you know, I, I love doing this and going along, but now I'm like, why am I here? Um, and then also reconceptualizing the way, the, like everyone always talks about, it's just such a um, common thing, but like enjoying the journey rather than the result. And I think like, I mean, it annoys me that I'm even saying this now because I know other people are going to be watching this and, and, and like know that everyone says that, but it is true. And if you can find like the little joys in every day in your training, like 
the times that you do get to go outside, they're what keep you going, I think, in, in how hard this period has been. Yeah, you know what? It, it, it might be what others say or lots of people say, but not everyone gets to actually practice it and live it. And, and you've had to go through that. So hearing it from you is quite sincere uh, because, you know, you've had to keep up your training and it's quite visible. Your life is, you know, you're not exactly in the spotlight, but to a number of people you are. And so everyone keeps a track of what you're doing. I even remember, you know, early days when there was a Zwift race and I was trying to find out who, who you know, how everyone went. And I, I sent a text to your dad and, uh, and he told me you had a technical issue. And so everyone kind of focuses on re results anyway. So I think it's been a good time to be able to take a step back and to hear that from you. I think everyone who will be listening will be really, um, really inspired, to be honest. Uh, I, 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 all credit to you. Everyone's had a really tough, but maybe we're a bit too close to this, but we really feel for the, the people who have uh, are just about to embark on something and have just gone on hold uh, for a little while. But you seem to be in the right place mentally. And, and I, I think it probably has a lot to do with the support network you've got as well. Is that, has, that been, has that been an important part? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think like it's definitely been a challenging period in some ways, but um, it also has like had reduced challenges in other ways. And I do have, I have like a, a handful of people who are really, really invested. Um, like not, not particularly necessarily in the journey, but like I have that, that sort of support. Um, like I ha I'm working with a physio at the moment who is just super um, positive and optimistic and just like on a bad day and you're like not super motivated, just even being able to have like a telehealth appointment and like go through some things you've been working on just to check in, like that kind of stuff. Um, it can really change like how you, how you sort of perceive everything. Um, but also uh, with Vanessa, with the VIS, um, lucky to have her now with the, working with the VIS because she's always super positive and optimistic and like obviously she's another Brunswick member. Um, but yeah, working with her as well, like I think, yeah, on those days where you, you might not be like fully like switched on or whatever, um, just like checking in with them or like... Um, Nick Owen, the sports scientist from VIS, um, and also Rowan White, who's my current coach, like just bouncing off, like, uh, like I feel like I'm not getting anywhere or like, you know, a lot of the time when you're training, the progression you can't see. And it feels like you're just pushing yourself to your limit every day and getting nowhere. And I think that's been something that I've been um, finding difficult through this period. But um, I just keep reminding myself that, the hard work eventually does pay off. So yeah, I think if anyone's watching this and, and feels like they're just not getting anywhere, I think you just got to keep turning up and keep doing what you can do each day. And eventually you'll get, you'll see the results. It's great advice and, and we'll be out of it. We'll be out of this and um, hopefully we'll look back and go, well, it actually, you know, it was, a, it, it seemed like a long time and forever at the time, but, but I'm better for it. So let, 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 let's, let's talk about study because that's been uh, an, an interesting year for people studying. And it doesn't matter what year you're in. I mean, Ava's in year nine and it's been a challenge. Anyone in year 12, it's a challenge. And people at uni, it's a challenge, particularly when you've been doing your study in, in, in different states and then having to go online. Well, what's, what's that been like? And we were talking before the interview about how that's changed now the first period of lockdown, it was different methods and different approach to what it is now. Just a quick summary of how that, that part of the journey has been. Yeah, well, for me, um, it hasn't been the most challenging part. Um, my brother and sister, Hannah and James, who came to Brunswick Cycling Club um, when they were younger, they've been doing year 12. So I think for them, like watching them have to do that, because I have the flexibility of taking a semester off or you know, like doing as many subjects as I want. Um, but for them, yeah, I think the way they described it was like, it's basically none of the good things about school and just homework constantly. So yeah. um, I feel like lucky that I, I don't have to go through that. And um, I mean, like I've only got three subjects to go in my uni degree. So I feel like I have um, developed the study habits already. So in some ways that's been easier, but um 
I do take study very seriously. Uh, I see myself doing postgraduate studies after I retire from cycling and um, the courses I'm looking at are pretty competitive. So I'm just trying to keep my grades up through this period and through my degree so that once I do decide to retire in 10 years time or whenever it is, um, I have that option of uh, like of a funded spot that I don't have to fork out a hundred grand for. <laughs> Sensible, very sensible. So, so what are you studying, Ruby? What are you, what are you studying to be? So I am doing a Bachelor of Science in and majoring in neuroscience. Um, so I'd like to go into some sort of um, area in that kind of area. I'm not sure specifically what, um, but something probably in like the clinical realm. Um, but yeah, I still, I guess, because I see that as a fair way off at the moment. Um, considering most of those degrees I have to do full time and just wouldn't work with cycling. So, um, but yeah, something in that area. Okay. And you mentioned role models before, people that you look up to. Uh, can you, can you just uh, talk about, you know, one or two of those role models and, and why they're role models? Yeah, well, this is um, something that I always, I don't really think about until I get asked this question and then I really struggle to remember my mm -hmm. role models. But then um, during day to day life, I definitely have people that I look up to. And a lot of them, I think in, in terms of cycling, are Australian cyclists. I think we're really lucky to have such incredible talent um, in, in Australia and like the women um, riders like Chloe Hosking and Amanda Spratt. Um, I think they're just, they're very classy riders. They're very, very um, tactically astute, skilled, physiologically incredible and pretty underrated. Like they don't always sell themselves as like, I think they're pretty um, humble. And if you meet them, they're pretty down to earth. So I think I definitely aspire to be um, like that when at some point. Um, but then I have, oh, I, I like like, I think everyone in Brunswick Cycling Club sees Sarah um, as a role model. And I think there's some aspects of Sarah, just her tenaciousness. Um, like I've been in contact with her a bit through this period. She's in Melbourne getting through this period as well. Um, but yeah, I really, I mean, she's younger than me, but I really admire a lot of her traits. Um, but uh, in terms of other people, like not cycling related, um, I guess, Adam Goods is someone who I really aspire, like is very inspiring because he's taken a lot of risks with his professional career to do something that he cares about and that has made a difference for a lot of people in Australia. So, and really the whole world that follow um, AFL. So yeah, that's, that's someone who I really look up to. Well, they're great role models. So I couldn't agree more about um, Adam Goods, incredible human being. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately lost to the, to the game at the moment because he, he, there's a lot of repair that needs to take place there and, and it's not from his end either. But I think we're growing up as a country and, and um, people like Adam Goods play an important role. And I'm glad that people like Adam Goods inspire people like you. So that's, that's important. And when it comes back to our club, uh, which we'll talk about now, um, I'm very proud of being part of our club. Um, you've been part of our club for a long time. Your father's on the committee and he's a great committee member. And he's a really astute racing person who understands the craft and the sport. But I had a question for you about what you, uh, how do you define a Brunswick person? Because when you talk about humility and resilience and things like that, I actually see those traits in the culture of the club. Is that how you see it? And what other things do you, uh, would you, what words would you associate with what, what it's like to be a Brunswick person? Well, I think, um, this kind of comes back to like me reconceptualizing why, why I'm in cycling. And the first reason is because I love racing and that's, that's the reason why I'm there. And I think Brunswick, like we all love racing. Like that's why we're there. We're not a, you know, we, we do have amateur, like just riding, but a lot of it's about racing. It's a, it's a racing club. Um, but the second reason I think, and I think this is something that we, we, we always knew that was huge, but I think now more so, more so than ever is the community. And um, the reason why I'm still in the sport and 
the majority of the um, under 15s and under 17s that I raced with as a junior aren't because I was thinking through this like we actually there's there's about two or three girls who I who I know who are still riding um, who came through with me the reason why I'm in here is because I have had the support of the club and the community and the friendships. Um, I'm still really good friends with Paddy Butler, who who came up through the club. Um, and I've been riding with him actually, because he's in my 5k zone. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think it's it's the relationships and the support and it's, it's an unwavering support. It's a support that isn't dependent on success. And I think other clubs have, um, they prioritize the riders who are, um, who are like, doing really really well and when they're doing really really well but I think the thing about Brunswick is we value all our members and we really make an effort to make them all included we don't have like special sessions for our elite juniors and a fun session for our amateurs we just have like Thursday night motor pacing or we have you know Brunswick races at Northern Combine where everyone can attend and that inclusiveness and I think if anyone comes down to the track um, and just wants to give it a go no matter who they are how old they are you know, any, any trait they could have, we will include them. And I think that that's something that not many sporting clubs have. So I think we have to, like, that's something that a lot of teams and clubs should aspire to. Yeah, that's uh, wonderful words. It makes us all very proud, but I also believe that it's not something that should just be restricted um, or is special about it's, it's certainly special about our club, but it's really scalable. I mean, that type of attitude and that type of um, approach uh, is something that you, you see in, in, in dotted around in sports, and we need to all work hard to try and infiltrate all sports to feel this way. Because participation, everyone talks about it, and everyone talks about why it's important. But we seem to forget when success blinds our vision, it, it, it stops us from looking further ahead and we, and we think, oh, we better do this now. So I'm glad that that's something you adopt. So I look at people like you, Ruby, and I see you, you study hard and you're in the sport. And I wonder, and, and, and just before this uh, interview, I was on a very special um, limited audience only interview with uh, Fran Miller from uh, the CEO of Team Ineos. And um, what she was saying was, was really inspiring. And I was you know, listening to this very smart woman who wants to make a change. And she even suggested when the question about uh, women's Tour de France was mentioned, et cetera, that the UCI should just mandate that all teams have, um, have female teams, women teams, right? Really simple. And so the reason why I'm, I'm bringing this up is because do you, I, I would love to see people like you uh, with, with your great degrees and your great background be able to still be part of the sport when you're off the bike? Do you, do, do you think that that's something that, I mean, currently the way the sport is, maybe not, but do you see a move towards the future where you, you could see yourself play a part in the sport? And I'm not just talking about being on a committee. I'm saying actually really being employed in the sport and being a part of its growth. Yeah, well, I think um, career-wise, I don't see myself being involved in sport just because I see... Like, I, well, I say this now, it might be different. I, I think I'll always be involved in cycling, but I like having something separate. Like, I like having study that's not to do with sport or with people from sport. But I think um, something that I've kind of grappled with is being an elite athlete is extremely narcissistic and self-centred. And um, you have to put yourself and your physical condition and your mental condition before everything else. Um, and... I think I would really like to give back more to the community. Um, but to get, to get to the level that I'm trying to get to, it's really hard to, like, I'm, I'm trying to study and I'm trying to ride and I'm trying to have, like, relationships in my other life. And between all those three things, then, you know, adding volunteering and contributing. But at the same time, I know it's something that I've got to do at some point and I, like, I want to, I really want to give back. Um, so I guess it's, I actually think about it a lot. Sometimes when I'm writing, I, I think of different ideas and things that I could be doing. And um, definitely, hopefully, um, once I finish my degree, I'll have a bit more time to dabble in some activities, whether it's mentoring girls coming through. I know when I was under 17, Kendall Hodges mentored me for a little bit. Like she just was like, 
um, a point of call that I could text. So doing something like that or helping with NRS teams. Um, but I think coming back to like what you were talking about before um, and with women's cycling and with inclu inclusivity. And I think diversity, um, like diversity in ethnicity and socioeconomic um, background is something that cycling and a lot of sports um, lack, but I think especially cycling because there is that economic barrier to participation. And I think that's something that um, the sport is failing at at the moment at working on. I think we expect that people will come to us, but we don't look at the barriers that stop athletes coming to us or participants or people in the community. Um, so I'd really like to, to work on that and really look at it from, from that barriers to participation perspective. Like it's all well and good to say, oh, we want more women in the sport, but where is the community for those women to be, to be a part of? Because one woman coming to, I know personally from coming to teams or camps or different things, if you don't have a friendship group there and you don't feel welcome, that's you won't keep coming back like the reason why we come back is so we can hang out with our friends and do a workout and do a session and if we don't create those environments that are inclusive um for specific groups of people those people will will won't retain in the sport so yeah yeah that's, that's, it, it's a great answer and yeah and you're right uh and it really what what you're saying is this has a lot of work to do and it's and it's it's a difficult task. It's not as simple as saying, "By the way, uh, everyone, we uh, we gladly accept more women. Aren't we great? Uh, what environment do you set up? Is it safe? Uh, is it friendly? Uh, is it non intimidating?" So we, you know, we love the association with Melbourne Hurt and Melbourne Dirt for that reason as well. And uh, even when we put in the submission for the pump track, uh, that was all around creating an environment that was safe and and was able to include people who perhaps don't want to ride on track or in, are intimidated by it and feel like they need to turn up with Lycra and a really flash bike to be able to ride. So how do you create that environment? And in many respects, we've had to decouple the venue from the club as well so that the venue becomes this place where you can go and by association, the club's there. Uh, so, yeah, you know, we think we're, we're doing a good job, but it can always be better. And, uh, and I think it, it, it improves when, when people are dedicated to something like you've just suggested you are to. So I'll put you down for 2028. Um, that's eight years, maybe, no, maybe 2038. Um, there's some, we want to do some other things and we'll um, nominate you for the committee. Okay. I'll put you down for that. Yeah, <laughs> I think, um, sorry, I, I just want to clarify. I think Brunswick as a whole does a really good job of those things I was talking about. Um, like I was thinking like at the clinic, it costs like $5 a family when I went there and you could have a bike and everything. And that really removes a barrier. What I guess I was trying to get at was like as a sport as a whole, if you look at the diversity within sport and you look at um, the people involved in sport, and I'm talking about from a Victorian perspective and Australian mm. perspective, but even a worldwide perspective, um, it does lack that diversity and inclusivity. And that's what I was trying to get at. And I think Brunswick is a small, um, stepping stone and a small part of that whole thing and I think we're punching above our weight like we really and that's what I was getting back to um mm. back at when I was talking about um what makes Brunswick great but um I guess in some ways that's inspired me well not inspired me but I think it, it makes me aware of the deficits within the whole cycling community as a whole and yeah yeah you're right I mean you didn't need to clarify. I always think we can work harder and be better. So that's just an attitude that I think we always have to have or else you just pat yourself on the back and think it ends. But, you know, to quote what you said before, it's a journey really. And so, it, 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 and it's a continuous improvement journey where what worked yesterday may not work tomorrow. You know, you know a, a feeling you had once may be different now. And that's what growth is all about. And the more you expose yourself to diversity of thought, the more you're going to get to that position. I want to talk about. Um, your next immediate steps, what, you know, anticipating a, a gradual removal of barriers and a return to some sort of normality. Have you had any discussions about what the next, you know, three and then six months might look like for you on the racing side? Or cycling yeah. Side? Um, well, basically the next sort of three months, um, I'm working on just trying to improve my team's pursuit. Um, 
which is somewhat challenging for Melbourne without a team's pursuit team. But um, there's, because Amy and Q are retired, there's a spot on the team. So that's kind of just the goal um, till November. And then the next, I've got a few different ideas for the next um, year. But yeah, I'm not, I think I'll probably have to wait till those November trials to really know what, what path that will be. But and, yeah. And your training's been mainly indoor based, obviously, or you, you're getting out and you're doing your, you're being creative with your 5k loops. Is the hard stuff inside at the moment? Um, yeah, pretty much. But luckily through the um, professional athlete scheme, I've been allowed to go back to uh, disc, which is an enormous privilege. Um, I, I don't think I was ever so excited and thankful that I got that <laughs> um, accepted as part of, technically it's a worker's permit. Um, but I understand that, yeah, a lot of people don't get that same opportunity. So it is a huge, huge privilege for this period. I think, um, but I think without it, it would be extremely challenging to go for that Olympic spot. So, yeah. Yeah, it's people like you that we pay to go to venues to watch to fill them up so when you're on your own in that place and you feel privileged remember that um, you know regardless of your result when you get to that stage there are there are people who actually go and watch that because that because we understand that we can't be as good as that because it's it's it, it you've got you've got gifts and you've got attitude that gets you somewhere and uh and the rest of us just like to watch that because we're it's like what it's the reason why i go to footy matches because i know that i was never going to be a, a footballer of any repute because I couldn't play the game. And so you go and you, you pay and it's like track racing when we were at the Commonwealth Games uh, two years ago. It was just incredible because you, you, you just, you're there and you're pinching yourself because you're seeing the very best, you know, and, and when you see the speeds, etc. watching a Shimano Supercrit and just standing alongside the rails and just seeing how fast the riders go. And then the other thing is the amount of injuries you put up with and, and the, um, that five steps back for one step forward. It's a sport that you don't always record wins. Uh, but speaking of wins, I've, I put this photo up uh, because I love it. I lo There's a couple of photos and there were a few um, stills there that, that could have been taken. But yeah, I just want to have a, a brief recap of your, your favourite moments. Uh, um, some of the interviews I've done, I've, I've gone on a, um, a crusade of showing different photos. Um, what we're what we're now starting to do as as I get a little bit smarter in doing this and time wise is adding photos at the end. So there'll be a nice uh, nice collage of photos that our viewers can watch. But um, I love this photo. Do you love it? Is it a special photo for you? I actually moment? haven't seen that photo before, but I've seen because oh, right. there's another photo where I've got my hands in the air too. But I was a bit late to the game. But um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it was it was it was a cool cool day um kind of marred by the crash on the last corner which we managed to escape but um but yeah yeah it was a very cool day and and and, and what what are other moments and other uh, achievements can you you know if you're in an elevator or at a barbecue and you just someone said to you please just give me three great highlights what would they be you reckon that's a very difficult question mm -hmm. um not every question's I, easy, you know. <laughs> I always tell this story when I do school talks. Um, and when I was at the clinic, uh, I was really not that talented. Um, and I, I crashed twice on the first time I was um, at the velodrome. And I think it took a lot of coaxing to get me back at the, at the, at the velodrome because <laughs> I was kind of traumatised. Um, but then it took me about like five years to place in a race. And I always looked at the, the they ha, used to have all these trophies every single week for the handicap and for the most improved. And I'd always look at them and I just like wanted one so bad because I'd never won anything. And um, I remember I won my first, I got, I think I got second in the mini Austral, which was the, the track race. And I got this mm -hmm. like trophy and it was just like, we had to do a, um, a speech, like a thank, thankful speech, a thank you speech. And I was just like, didn't know what to say and I was so excited. I was just like, this is amazing. And I'd just come off like a two week break from a holiday and I hadn't come to clinic for two weeks. And I was just like over the moon. Um, but yeah, that that's a pretty special memory. Um, 
in hindsight, like a small, a small win, but it was big at the time and still, still special. Um, in terms of other races, I'll probably think of a thousand um, later this tonight, but I think making the junior worlds team was cool. Um, when I got second in the IP, just because a few people had said that I probably wouldn't make it on the track. Um, so it was cool just to like, yeah, yeah say like I'm not actually that bad. <laughs> yeah. So I think that was, and also like knowing that I was going to get to travel overseas um, was exciting. So that was, I was pretty ecstatic um, when that happened. Um, but yeah, I think, I, I don't know. I have a lot of little moments and, yeah, there's probably too many to to go okay. through, but but yeah. Yeah, no, that's really good. I mean, it's it's remarkable that no one's ever prompted, but in every interview, when you ask for a highlight, it's often about something that happened when you're young, or an event in a race, uh, something that took place that no one really knows about. Uh, it, it was very very interesting too. Just talking to Cam the other day. Um, you know, Loretta Hansen sent a, um, sent him a message um, and, and just the race that she was in with Catalina and, um, you know, she, she recorded an over the limit time and, uh, and the, the back story is how much work she did to, to help a, a, another rider who was a bit scared on the descent. And that's a, you know, for, for a rider to actually uh, convey that and talk about that as being a highlight and getting a buzz out of it, especially someone who's now a seasoned rider, it just reminds you why we do it. That's what you said before, you know, and, and um, that memory of the clinic is great. And you probably learned how to taper too then because you had your two weeks off. So that's probably giving you an early, an early, um, early insight into tapering. I think that's what dad said at the time. <laughs> <laughs> he would have, he would have. Yeah. Um, and, and was it Cam who was interviewing you and, and, t and telling you what to say about uh, thank you parents, etc. Because Cam's always very good at that. Yeah, I think it would have been Cam. I, when I first started the first year I was there, um, was actually with Alan Grindle and he said I look like I was riding to school every time I was in a race <laughs> <laughs> but um, it took me a while to get get a competitive edge but yeah but then it was Cam mostly um, Dave and Helen um, yeah yeah and uh, you know we always ask because people like you grew up with um, uh, the great Alf Walker being being around and, and being a part of the scene what are the, um, what's just your, you know, when, when someone says Alf Walker, what do you think? Well, um, he was just always there. Like he was at everything. <laughs> he was, yeah, he came to every, um, every combine race um, for the juniors, like wind, rain, hail or shine. Um, I actually wrote a biography on him for my year eight um, English class. Because we had to do someone who um, inspired us, and he uh, he held the um, Olympic torch. Yes. I think it was in the two thousand Olympics. Yes. Um, but he has a lot of sayings that still stay with me. Um, one of them is, "A dog at a bike race is like a shark at a swimming race." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've heard um, that version with piranhas, but yeah, it's just yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's one of my favourite ones. Too. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I think uh, I realised, because um, I was quite young through most of the time that um, I had anything to do with him, but two, actually two memories. One was uh, every time, like, Dad would help out at the um, combine races and I would, like, hang around with him and tidy up and Alf would be the last car in the car park waiting for Dad to get in the car and go <laughs> and he'd be like, hurry up. <laughs> because he would always make sure that everyone um, had like had started their car to make sure that they hadn't run out of batteries and were stranded in some country town. Like that's kind of the kind of guy Alf was. Yeah. Um, and I also remember, cause he was always at Tuesday nights and he didn't really say much to you most of the time. Like he wouldn't be like, Oh wow, you're going really well. Like, so if he, if he ever gave you a compliment, it meant you were going really, really well. And yeah. one time he said, um, cause I used to race the boys he said, oh, now she's got a bit of mongrel in her because I'd like pushed one of the boys out of the way and like done something. So, yeah. <laughs> They're wonderful memories, wonderful memories. Uh, so we committed to ourselves that we'd keep it res reasonably short because people's attention spans are a bit uh, 
a bit all over the place, but we're, uh, we're approaching Father's Day. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure I'll get this up before Father's Day. So that's my commitment. So uh, I, I won't be, um, uh, no one can accuse me of, uh, of missing it by a day. So we'll commit to getting this up. Uh, have you ever raced against or been in the same race as dad? Yeah, many times. <laughs> yeah. And uh, how many times has he actually come out in front? A few, not many mm. now, but a few. Yeah. 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 There's a tipping point, isn't there? I'm starting to feel it myself where the tipping point comes and there's a point of no return. All you see is the number going past you. And um, he's quite, uh, he's quite passionate at the moment, not passionate, but he's jumped on the Zwift um, wagon. That's for sure. uh, I thought I I did 500 Ks on Zwift two weeks ago in in a week. And I thought that was crazy, but he's now talking, he's sending me text messages about, I do this right and that right. And that, like, is this a condition that we need to worry about? I'm a little bit worried. I'm worried um, actually about riding with him on the road when, when everything goes back, because I think he's lost a fair bit of weight and he's pretty strong at the moment. But yeah, he's um, doing a five hour ride on Sunday um, so that he can go into the door to win the same bike that I have. <laughs> oh, right. So yeah, cause he did send a message out to a few of us about that. And then he, he actually, he actually followed it up with, you can just ride with me for part of it if you want. Because yeah. I, I reckon the minute everyone read that, they went, uh, no, I, I'm yeah. not doing that. Uh, but, uh, so that's going to be his father's day. He's going to be on the bike for five oh, hours. Just the morning. He gets up pretty yeah. early. So yeah, he does. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, he, he loves cycling. Like he really, really loves pretty much every aspect of cycling. Yeah. Aside from cleaning his bike, probably. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, and I think... I don't actually share that that same love that he has, I think like about every aspect. I mean, I watch, I watch a few races here and there, but I'm primarily in it because I love racing and Mm -hmm. obviously the community, but he, he loves everything. He loves the analysis. He loves listening to cycling podcasts and like keep um, cycling races. Like he really loves it. So yeah, it's pretty cool how passionate he is about it. Oh, I I love it. And as a, um, yeah, you know, as a, a confidant and a person who uh, is on our committee, I, I just, I, I can't speak highly enough of, of Andrew, to be honest. Um, and I'm not just saying that. He's, he's incredible for us and incredible for cycling in Victoria. Really balanced. And I can see many of, um, many of his traits in you too. So um, that, that's, that's quite good. And it's Father's Day, so we need to talk up dads because we're all cool. And we're all great. Um, what's your... Uh, just to finish off, what's your what's your favourite riding place? What's a place that you you just say oh, I just like to go away and ride, and it doesn't have to be on a road bike; it can be on a mountain bike or whatever. Um, what's that one place that just takes you away? Um, I'm gonna say something that will be very controversial. <laughs> okay. Um, but I really love Richmond Boulevard, <laughs> which is like a three-kilometer section of road <laughs> in yeah. the middle of the city. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I rode there a lot over the summer because if I want to do a ride um, that's kind of under three hours, um, Mm. it's kind of the place I go to because there's no traffic lights. And yeah, so I know all the Richmond locals and they all know me. We all ride at a similar time and wave at each other. (laughs) Um, But yeah, funnily enough, I've just, I have a weird love of that place now. Whatever, whatever. Everyone hates it, but yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's um, I I can't, I can't see what the appeal is, but it's fine. Whatever, if you like it, that's good. Uh, I um, okay. Well, look, we'll 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 finish off. I think you've got um, you've you've got an enormous future. We know that, but I just love your temperament. I love your attitude, the way you you approach things. It's a real credit to you. Um, don't forget though to reach out and make sure you know there's a huge family of um, Brunswick people here who really love you but um, you know our arms are always open to we don't just you hit the nail on the head we don't just look at results in fact results are an outcome of of an environment they're not the reason why you're there and that's why we don't have programs etc and it's so great to talk to someone who's been riding a bike for a long time you're still only not even 22 and uh, it's been worth the wait, Ruby. I've really enjoyed this chat and um, I'll, I'll let you sign off and, 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 and finish off the interview if you like. 
Yeah, firstly, I'd like to apologise to you, Ag, because I know you've been um, <laughs> on my back for a bit trying to get an interview and I'm sometimes quite hard to um, <laughs> catch. But, yeah, it's been good to do the interview. Um, and, yeah, I just – I think I really um, – I really miss club racing. I really love um, crits and like seeing Brunswick members and other clubs out at crits and the community aspect. And I'm missing that at the moment. Um, so I hopefully, and Northern Combines are the best. So hopefully I will see everyone out there racing soon. Um, and just, I guess like through this period, you don't have to be super motivated you don't have to be like training every single day. You don't have to be doing anything, but bring it back to what, what brings you um, joy and what, what makes you feel better, I guess. And sometimes you can feel really shit and not feel like doing any exercise or like getting on the bike, but having that knowledge that knowing that getting through that hour will make you feel better at the end. So it's like balance of being kind to yourself, but also knowing what's best for, you, for yourself, if you know what I mean. And mm. my, my sort of philosophy through this period has been take each day at, at a day and make it the best day you can be, make it the best day you can make it. And if that's marginally better than a really bad day, that's better than a really bad day. And rather than seeing it as a pressure, like any pressure about doing anything, so yeah, try and make it an opportunity, like no pressure, all the opportunity. And each session is that opportunity. So they're the kind of things I've been trying to rewire in my brain. Um, but hopefully that could help someone if they're still listening. <laughs> well, I'm going to make sure that when we post this, that, um, that everyone does wait until the end because that was great and it was unrehearsed and I really appreciate it. it it's, it's rather inspiring. Uh, it's also, um, it's, it's also really, uh, really insightful and uh, I appreciate it. So thanks Ruby and good luck with when we get out of this and your studies and can't wait to talk to you about results and racing and just getting back into those crits, etc. I can't wait myself actually. Everyone wants to get out there and kit up, put a number on and um, I'll be at the back, you'll be at the front, but it doesn't really matter, right? Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks Bag. Yeah. See ya.